23-year-old Evelyn Balibayuva, a native of Azerbaijan, lived in Unit 11 at 11 Hodges Avenue in Quincy, Massachusetts, and worked at a local restaurant. She spoke with her mother nightly, who still lived in her home country, but then her mother abruptly stopped hearing from her. Evelyn's boyfriend, Duncan Boyd, reported her missing on July 19, 2011. Upon searching her apartment, her door was found left ajar, and her bedroom furniture had been moved, and both her cell phones and laptop were missing. Her U.S. visa, passport, and immigration papers were all left behind along with a whiteboard where she noted upcoming events. That same day, Boston police reported that her pocketbook with her checkbook, student ID, and cell phones had been found in Dorchester and turned in by a citizen. However, it would be 10 more days before the Quincy police filed a missing persons report. During the investigation, it was discovered that the last verified sighting of Evelyn was on a surveillance camera in Quincy on July 17th, two days before her boyfriend reported her missing. She was sighted stepping off a North Quincy Red Line train just 200 yards from her apartment shortly after leaving work around midnight. One of her concerned friends came into town to help with the search and was told by police that adults have the right to go missing. Frustrated, her friends and boyfriend hired a private investigator less than a week after her disappearance due to the lack of interest by the police. They also contacted neighboring police departments, media outlets to push for a deeper investigation, and since she had retained her citizenship, the Azerbaijan Embassy. It would still take three weeks for the case to be handed over to the state police. When they took a second look at Evelyn's apartment, they found a significant amount of blood under the carpet in Evelyn's bedroom, indicating that she was attacked and possibly killed there. Someone had attempted to clean the carpet, but blood had seeped underneath. The building's handyman would later admit that suspiciously, he had cleaned her apartment after she disappeared. The building's handyman was John Castonge, who was interviewed and ultimately named a suspect. While he told investigators he had never seen nor met Evelyn, her roommate would completely contradict this. John was also made a suspect because of his past crimes. In 1987, he approached a nine-year-old girl walking her beagle puppy and lured her to a remote area by saying he knew where they could pick some blueberries. Instead, he would take her to a gravel pit where he would physically and sexually assault her. Police said John told them that he had master keys to all the doors and apartments and said he was at Evelyn's building on the day she was last seen, but that he did not see her or harm her. He and his lawyer claimed that he was just an easy target because of his criminal background. John is the prime suspect in Evelyn's presumed murder, but he has never been charged in her case. He pled guilty to probation violation after her disappearance and served 15 months in federal prison before being released in 2015. Evelyn's family stated that since the Quincy police didn't initially take Evelyn's disappearance seriously, that John slipped through the cracks in the system. Her boyfriend, Duncan, was eventually ruled out as a suspect. As of today, Evelyn has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Vicki Lockwood was born October 30, 1949, in Harper, Kansas, and raised on a wheat farm. In 1968, she settled in Worcester, Massachusetts with her fiancé, Lowell Lamberton, who at the time was earning a degree to become a college professor while she was earning her bachelor's degree from Clark University. They would marry the next year in 1969. In 1974, after only five years of marriage, Vicki and Lowell would separate. At this time, 24-year-old Vicki was getting very close to earning her master's degree in psychology at Assumption College. However, she would never get the chance because she would go missing only one month after their separation. When Vicki and Lowell had separated, she moved out of the couple's home and into an apartment at 27 Westford Road in Worcester. She would store the majority of her personal belongings in a garage owned by her psychology professor, Dr. Roger Barker. She and Dr. Barker, who was also married, were allegedly having an affair. He would even accompany her to New York City when she applied for her psychology doctorate at Columbia University in early 1974. 
Vicky's husband suspected that she was involved in a relationship with Barker at the time. Her brother also stated that he had seen the couple together at the mall. Some of her friends at the time admitted that they knew about the affair and that she wanted to marry him. The day before she vanished in February of 1974, Vicki called her husband and said she wanted to discuss getting back together. At this time, the couple had been estranged for about six weeks, but they made plans to have dinner when she returned from a weekend trip to Maine with one of her girlfriends. However, her husband became very concerned when she failed to contact him after the weekend and called the girlfriend who supposedly accompanied her to Maine. The friend said that she and Vicky had not spoken recently and that there had been no trip to Maine planned. Vicky's husband went to Assumption College to ask if Dr. Barker had any knowledge of his wife's whereabouts. However, staff members told him that Dr. Barker was in Bell, Colorado for a skiing trip. He had only planned to spend the weekend, but claimed he had been hospitalized with pneumonia and had to stay in Colorado for two more weeks. His wife, however, had only stayed the weekend and had returned to Massachusetts. It is believed Vicki may have traveled to Vail after Dr. Barker's wife left, but this could never be proven. Lowell would visit Dr. Barker again sometime during March 1974, about a month after Vicki was last seen. Dr. Barker admitted that he was storing her belongings in his garage, but claimed he did not know Vicki well and did not know her whereabouts. He also insinuated he believed she found another romantic partner. Vicky's two brothers would retrieve her possessions from Barker's garage in 1975, one year after she disappeared. Friends of Vicky claimed they didn't know where she was and said she never told them of her plans. Dr. Barker was also questioned, but once again maintained his innocence, saying he knew nothing about her disappearance and denied ever having a romantic relationship with her. He suggested the only contact with her was that he helped her move out of her husband's home and allowed her to store her belongings in his garage. Some of her family members believed she chose to leave voluntarily and found a new relationship with another man. Her husband said that the idea wasn't that far-fetched because she had considered the idea prior to her disappearance. As a result, a missing persons report was never filed for Vicki until 2010 after her brother created a webpage dedicated to her disappearance and it caught the eye of a Worcester police detective who filed a missing persons report. This was 36 years after she vanished. Come to find out, her social security number was never used after she disappeared in 1974 and she never renewed her driver's license. One of Vicky's brothers located a close friend of Vicky's in 1980 who had not been questioned after Vicky's initial 1974 disappearance. Her friend, Ann Lawson, at one point lived on the same floor as Vicky at 74 Beaver Street and they talked every day. She said that Vicky called her the night she last spoke to her estranged husband and told her that she was going to Colorado. Vicki promised to call Anne when she returned, but she never heard from her again. Anne said she can't believe her friend vanished without keeping in touch with anyone close to her. Although Vicki grew up in Harper, Kansas, she told people she was originally from Colorado. Her husband believed she was ashamed of her upbringing. In a 2012 interview, her husband reported that shortly after her disappearance, a phone call was placed to a neighbor of her family's former home looking for Vicki's family. However, her family had moved to Texas at the time of the strange call. The anonymous caller stated that Vicki had left for Europe and asked for her husband Lowell's phone number. Police investigated and found no evidence of her traveling there. Her husband also stated that he got an acceptance letter on her behalf from New York University, but he was unaware that she had ever applied there. Dr. Barker, who supposedly kept her stuff in his garage, has been interviewed by police. However, he stated that he does not remember ever going to Colorado with Vicki. A DNA profile for Vicki was created in NamUs, but no remains have matched. At one point, authorities wondered if she was the Lady in the Dunes, a Jane Doe whose body was found in Provincetown on July 26, 1974. However, the body was not that of Vicky's, and as of today, she has never been found and the case remains unsolved.
Jennifer Bugwa was born in Kenya on August 15, 1982. When she was around 18 years old, she would move to Taunton, Massachusetts, and then in 2012, she moved into an apartment in the 500 block of South Main Street in Fall River, Massachusetts. She had two sisters who also lived in Massachusetts, while the rest of her family remained in Kenya. She would work as a nurse in various nursing homes and also worked for Mary Kay Cosmetics. 31-year-old Jennifer was last seen by a neighbor outside her apartment building on May 27, 2014. Her neighbor saw her inside her car shuffling papers. The next day, her gray Toyota Camry was found abandoned at a Shell gas station off Route 1 in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, near Route 295. It was about a 30-minute drive from her apartment, and it had apparently been left there between midnight and 3 a.m. Investigators would find keys and one of her sandals in a nearby dumpster. Her apartment was found with the lights and TV left on, along with her purse and her driver's license and cell phone still inside. A state police emergency response team performed a search of the area for Jennifer, but she was never found. Her family describes her as quiet and reserved, and as far as they know, she was single at the time she disappeared. The last activity on her Facebook page was on May 19th, and her family reported that she could have been depressed. Her family hired a private investigator, but due to the lack of money, would no longer be able to use their services. Strangely, her landlord allegedly refused to let police or her family inside her apartment when she disappeared. The next day, he packed up all of her things and moved them out of the apartment. Her family said they worried the action of the landlord may have hampered the investigation and possibly prevented the police from finding any clues that might have led to Jennifer. Her loved ones are desperate for answers, but there are little details available in this case, and as of today, it remains unsolved. Christopher Brian Lewis was born July 20, 2000, and was nicknamed Chris. He went to Lee School and lived in Boston, Massachusetts, and was the oldest of four boys. On February 4, 2014, the school bus dropped 13-year-old Chris off at the corner of Morton and West Selden in the Dorchester area as it usually did. One of his friends walked with him until they were only a block from Chris's home. He was expected home at 5.30 p.m., but when he had not arrived or called by 6 p.m., his mother Nina became very worried. According to Nina, Chris was responsible about coming home on time and letting her know if he was going to be late. The Boston Police Department reports that Chris has gone missing on previous occasions, but was always found in Dorchester in the Fields Corner area. Nina says that her son has never run away and was always either in school or at home. However, Chris never arrived home that evening and has never been heard from again. Authorities believe he might have left on his own accord, but there is no concrete evidence to prove this. There are very few details available in this case, and his family still seeks answers, but as of today, the case remains unsolved. Jesus de la Cruz was born January 3, 1990 to Magdalena Rodriguez and Juan de la Cruz. When he was six years old, he went to Connery Elementary School and lived on Park Street in Lynn, Massachusetts with his mother, but his father lived in Texas. On September 28, 1996, around 6 p.m., Jesus and a nine-year-old boy were walking on the sidewalk toward his home on Park Street. The boys were heading home after playing in Bennett's Circle for several hours, and Jesus was pushing his pink huffy bicycle, which had two flat tires at the time. The boys were approached by a man pushing a mountain bike along with his dog. Jesus asked the man if he could have the bike, which the man told him yes, and Jesus started following the man towards the Lynn Common area. Jesus' friend did not follow them because he was under instructions to wait for his father. Jesus' mother was visiting a neighborhood friend, and when she returned home around 7 p.m., Jesus was not there. She would report him missing after midnight. The man that lured Jesus away with the promise of a new bicycle was soon identified as 26-year-old Robert Levesque. 
The man was walking with either a shepherd or collie breed dog with one white eye and one brown eye. The man was well known by the children in the neighborhood because of his dog's distinctive features of having two different colored eyes. Robert lived in an apartment on Western Avenue just around the corner from Jesus' home. When investigators searched Robert's apartment, they discovered duct tape, handcuffs, a hammer, and the dog with two different colored eyes. It is not known if the items were related to Jesus' disappearance. Strangely, Robert called in sick at his job where he worked as a store clerk at the Crosby's Market in Marblehead the same night that Jesus disappeared. He was arrested about a month later and charged with a parole violation, motor vehicle offenses, and possession of stolen property in mid-October 1996. However, he was never charged in connection with Jesus' disappearance due to lack of evidence. The Massachusetts Department of Social Services accused Jesus' mother of neglect in the weeks following her son's disappearance. The agency said that Rodriguez did not report Jesus as a missing child until midnight on September 28th, six hours after his apparent abduction. Others speculated that Jesus was abducted as the result of theorized drug use by his family members. However, his mother denied any wrongdoing in her son's case and maintained that the claims were the result of racism against Hispanic individuals. Various rumors concerning Jesus' case circulated after his disappearance. Some people claimed that he had been taken to Puerto Rico, New York City, or maybe even the Dominican Republic as part of a deal to keep his mom out of trouble. She has denied the allegations and has since moved to another part of Massachusetts where she works in a group home as a counselor for troubled kids. Jesus' father had been accused of abusing Jesus and threatening to abduct him from Magdalena's custody prior to his disappearance. Authorities stated that Juan was at home at the time his son went missing and has never been charged in connection with his disappearance. He has cooperated and maintained contact with the investigators working on the case. A DNA sample was obtained from Juan in 2011, which was profiled and uploaded into CODIS in hopes of finding a match. At one point, the pond at Pine Grove Cemetery was drained along with other ponds, but no evidence was found. There have been many possible sightings of Jesus around the country over the years, but none of the sightings have been confirmed. Police are hopeful that Jesus is still alive, but as of today, this case remains unsolved.